whole lot of interest in it. It started in about, uh, about 1978, and it really started generating a lot of interest and a lot of activism on behalf of a series of grassroots parents in the United States who were overwhelmingly white, overwhelmingly middle class, and overwhelmingly female. It was very much so a mother's movement instead of a parent's movement that generated a lot of sympathy through coverage in the national media, certainly through a relationship and an alliance with the Reagan administration, and through a growing sense of political and social conservatism that was sort of sweeping the United States anyway. And the power of the parent movement and how they became, um, this influence that they became was because they shifted the conversation about marijuana use in the United States so dramatically and so dynamically. So by the time Keith, and it's crazy to write a history about someone seated two seats to my right. <laughs> oh my god, it's amazing, right? Um, so by the time Keith grounded normal and got the conversation going, marijuana use is basically seen as an adult right, something that you can do in the privacy of your own home, and the laws against it were far more harmful to the individual than the use of the drug itself. By the time the parent movement founded, was founded in the summer of 1976, in Atlanta, they changed the conversation to, yes, but what about the children? But by 1979, like, there are all these surveys and things like that. One out of nine high school seniors was smoking pot daily. Kids were getting access to the drug by age 12 or 13, and these parents were incredibly upset about this. They said, we have no idea what's going to happen to these kids having access to this drug. Boys are going to grow breasts. Chromosomes are going to be damaged. Everything's going to go wrong. A generation of semi-zombies a congressman characterized this drug use as the generation of semi-zombies in the post-Berkeley period are going to rise up, take over our welfare state, we're going to ruin America, oh my god, everything's going to go wrong. Um, and that was incredibly powerful. It had a whole lot of cultural cachet, particularly by the time they aligned with the Reagan administration. By 1988 or so, when uh, the Reagans left the White House, they returned to California, Nancy Reagan took her fundraising abilities with her back to the Golden State where we are now. Money is really drying up, and primarily it's also because the parent movement was so effective. Youthful use of marijuana had dramatically dropped, and basically you found out that if you are smoking pot, you're kind of young, you're probably not going to die. You're not gonna grow breasts if you're a boy. Chromosomes weren't ruined. Uh, the, motion, the movement lost a lot of its momentum. Basically by the time uh, Clinton came into office in about 1992. There are still a few outliers, and there are still a few people who are, who are holding on. Sue Rushi, who Alan has debated repeatedly in various media formats, holds on and still is like fighting the good fight. Most everyone else, they're older, they're in their 70s, they're in their 80s, they're retired. Um, they're no longer as active as they used to be, but there's a few people who uh, continue it. However, the basis and the foundation to continue a movement like that with this incredible, enormous expanse has really dried up. But about 15 year period, they were all over this. Well, that's a very deaf, um, I, I would suggest, description, and very briefly, about what really is one of the most powerful entities that leveled, stopped marijuana law reform movement on its butt in the early 1980s. A couple follow-up questions. Um, do you think they're victims of their own success? Yes. Absolutely. Um, I mean, this was for the most part a movement of housewives and mothers who uh, were suddenly thrust into this national spotlight. Uh, they formed organizations, nonprofits, things like that, and started getting recognition and funding that they don't, I don't think that they were fully capable of handling. Uh, and they weren't creating a foundation under themselves to perpetuate this. And it's a parents' movement, right? So if parents are continuing, like, you know, after 10 years, 20 years, if, parents are still having children and they're not that concerned about their children's pot use, the actual sort of impetus, the thrust for the movement is going to dry up. So they became really, really powerful, really, really quickly, and didn't have the chance to actually build up any sort of foundation for themselves. Victims of their own success, for sure. Uh, my follow-up to that is that uh, Sue Ruscha, essentially, today, is a government grant recipient. Um, she makes probably more money than most of us make in this room, wink, wink. Um, and so she's stratified in a government bureaucracy that nobody knows. You don't hear her anymore. I mean, I like the baby Sue. She's good therapy, believe me. And so it's unfortunate she doesn't feel like she has to debate because she's got hundreds of thousands of dollars coming into her shop. Um, one of the things that she does is she runs effectively like a journalistic boot camp out of Emory University where 
she and the um, other faculty asked producers and directors and writers and editors to come for a week to learn how to report on the drug war. You know, never use the word harm reduction, never quote anything from Ethan Nadelman, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so she's still working behind the scenes, oh, believe me, but she doesn't have, I don't think, the kind of voice that she did when it was her own skin in the game, which I guess is my bias in all of this. Um, do you perceive that now today there is a parents' movement in favor of ending prohibition? Yeah, and I think that's the power of the Rural Women's Alliance. I think that's the power of like a lot of other things. I had the opportunity to introduce Sandy Burbank, if anyone knows her yeah. from Mothers Against This. Yeah, she's awesome. And she's still going strong. And I feel like, similar to what Tom was saying, there's a, there's a peace movement to drive marijuana reformation. Um, there, I think it's also a very distinct possibility of having people mothers saying, you know, why are you locking up my kid for 18, 20 years? Why are you doing this? Um, there's a very powerful, I think, po potential and possibility for that. Go form them. So. <laughs> I don't like kids, so, you know. <laughs> Watching uh, marijuana law reform take off, become very popular, as Emily's indicated, one day you have some angry women, effectively, angry mothers, that's an important distinction here, uh, basically on your doorstep. So what can you relate to us all these years later about what was that like, and what was the strategy at the time? Well, um, first off, I would concede that we were caught uh, off balance by it. During all of the 70s, from 72 when the Marijuana Commission report came out, through, say, 79, almost without fail, any major media show that focused on marijuana and marijuana policy was sympathetic to our position. The major players, now not every local station, of course, but the major players in the national media have either were marijuana smokers themselves or they were certainly familiar enough with it that they were really on our side. They were helping us get the message out. So we had no fear uh, about our sort of opponents that we saw coming in from the fringes. And when I first heard the argument uh, of just say no, and I think this might have been right before just say no, but the, the parents were concerned about what about the kids. Uh, we sort of thought it was irrelevant. Uh, nobody was proposing that kids should smoke marijuana, so what the hell is that question even about? <laughs> but I'll tell you when we found out. I think it was 79. It was a CBS News special, I believe, and I think Ed Bradley may have been the host of the late Ed Bradley. And Ed was a friend of mine. And my goodness, I have smoked with him many times over the years, and I, I knew where his oil is laid. And, uh, when that program came on, and it was at least an hour, it was especially it did, my God, it was just giving every argument these uh, parents' anti-drug groups had and giving it incredible credibility and all of a sudden essentially saying what these people are at normal that are trying to get everybody high, uh, what they're skipping over is the damage they're doing to the kids. Until I saw that special, uh, I, I just didn't take it very seriously, but I can tell you, it only took you and that one time on national television, and we knew we had a problem on our hands. And frankly, uh, as I say, not long after that, then you had Nancy Reagan and Just Say No. And at the time, we couldn't understand it. What had happened? We had all this momentum going in the 70s, and now all of a sudden, in, by 79 or 80 or 81, the momentum seemed to be switching back in the other direction. With the benefit of hindsight and a lot of polling that was done, you could actually see what happened. Um, the mood of the country began to swing in a far more conservative direction. Uh, from when we started normal, and it was not because we started normal, I think the mood of the country was lightening up about 1970 anyway, but up through about 79, the surveys all showed we were gaining support every year. We didn't have majority support because we only had 12%, I think it was Pulse at 13 or something at the beginning. It was actually 12%, the first Gallup poll was taken in 1979. But we were increasing incrementally every year and we assumed that we had to win the public opinion at our back and it would never change. Well, when you look at those polling results now in hindsight, what you see is, by 79, the polls started back down, less in favor of our position, and they continued until 1990. And that's relevant because you understand from the last state we won decriminalization was Nebraska in 77 or 78, I think 78. 
We didn't, the movement, we, did not win another single statewide victory for 18 years. Now, we held on to the 11 states that had criminalized marijuana, only sometimes by, by the fingernails, but we managed to beat back efforts to repeal those laws. But we didn't win another single state until 1996, when California passed Prop 215. polling is, uh, you can see why we won California in 1996, because starting about 1990, the mood of the country began to come back in our direction. Uh, and when that happens, folks, I think the lesson we learned then, and I'm going to be stressing this week in every case that I have, don't take the public support we currently enjoy for granted. There is no guarantee that two years or five years from now we're going to have that. I think we are. But I thought we were in the late 1970s, and I think they are wrong. So uh, I, I would say this, make hay while the sun shines, we used to say on the floor. Uh, right now, we enjoy the highest level of support we've ever enjoyed in this country. It's over 50% nationwide, which means on the east and west coast, we're 55, 58% support. So when people say to me, I have a problem with that initiative in Washington, it's not perfect. Or I have a problem with that initiative in Colorado, it's not perfect. I would say to you understand, you may not have a chance for another legalization initiative for four years or even eight years, and there is no guarantee you're going to have the support to win it in four years. So let's legalize marijuana now, and we can perfect that legalization over the next two years. She comes in and interviews us about you know what's happening, in, what happened in the past, what could happen in the future. I'm 25 years younger than Keith, or so I'm 47. So I am the generation. I am the generation that this was entirely targeted to. So in 1978, Keith, uh, there was an announcement over our elementary school that we were all going to go into the gym and watch an NBC special called Reading, right. Writing, and Reefer. <laughs> And when there was only three networks, more or less, in the United States, uh, to get all so many elementary schools. This was in, I was in Amherst, Massachusetts, a very progressive college town, but still it was pervasive. And so that parents' movement I saw come together in that NBC special, uh, which Tom Brokaw uh, was the uh, host of. We have charted now for so long marijuana attitudes in this country that here's the important facts I would suggest regarding demographics. Between the ages of 25 and 52, we as Americans lose our minds about marijuana because of our children. Uh, because normal's been around so long, we can now chart the fact that as people turn into their 50s, they then have a different attitude, a more progressive one, if you will, about marijuana. And regarding uh, the parents' movement today, uh, I do think that the NWA is a really strong vehicle to address this, and that today I can't even imagine not listening to parents. If someone is talking to us today about marijuana, usually it's forward-looking about how will it work for my children. It's not a fearful, demonized, vilified thing. So having heard this, Mitchell, Mitch, what is your, or your thoughts about about the movement uh, that Keith found himself starting. Emily has now well chartered this parents' movement, and um, you have observed and written about this yourself. Uh, the, the history of science and ignorance, if you will. In, in the beginning, we always heard uh, outrageous claims about cannabis and didn't often have data, or even had manufactured data, data that weren't true. Uh, re recently, Gabriel Nahas died, and a lot of folks did not weep because he made up data suggesting that cannabis did pretty much everything evil you could possibly imagine and a whole bunch of things you would never imagine. <laughs> As the data keep coming in, we see how much effort researchers have to go to in order to make cannabis sound bad. Oh, wait, it changes your brain structure. As long as I have 64 things on your head and make you do the most complicated tasks ever done in the world, I can finally see yours is almost this different from another person's. Obviously, the fact that we have to go through these kinds of steps is pretty telling. And as more and more literature gets published, we keep finding you know, the outrageous truths that cannabis makes you sleepy and hungry. 
<laughs> With that in mind, though, I, I keep wanting to spread the news so that every time I uh, get somebody calling up saying, I hear marijuana makes you schizophrenic, I hear marijuana does this, I hear marijuana does that, my wife can handle these calls on the phone now. And that really makes me happy. And so I feel like every time somebody spreads the word just a little bit, it's really a win for our side. I was down at the gym this morning at 7 in the morning, I'm not bragging, I'm actually telling a story because Richard Lee's mother was there talking it up right in the middle of the gym with the guy right next to her. someone talk about how racist cannabis laws are while I was on the exercise bike. <laughs> we really have made progress, and I know there are times in this conference where you can think, oh my god, things are so terrible, how are we going to ever recover? But we've never had three states considering legalization before. We've never had this many medical marijuana states before, and we've never had this many people polling saying, yes, I understand that tax and regulated market is the way to go. So, Hooray for us. <laughs> um, so it's just moving the conversation along and through here. Um, Keith, when uh, and you're going to allude a lot to, about this in your, in your remarks tomorrow, but in your infamous, we have so much fun with you by your claim that marijuana would be legal by 1978. Of course, we still do believe you. <laughs> so, uh, encap encapsulized, what, uh, where do you see the successes of the reform movement, not normal, but just the reform movement in general, and what are some just general fears you may have for the future? Well, I think sometimes uh, activists, as activists, all of us think that uh, we win particular debates or we make a little progress politically because we're crafty or we come up with an argument that they haven't heard before or we're a little brighter than our opponents who must be ignorant if they oppose uh, legalization. The, the reality is that's not really what makes a, a difference between winning and losing. In politics, what makes the difference is whether you have won the support of the hearts and minds of the majority of Americans. It's not a trickery. And so what I see now, of course, is that we know we literally have more living Americans who support full legalization than not. So for the moment, I think, um, I feel pretty comfortable. That's not going to turn around overnight, even as I fear that don't assume it will be just as strong in five years or ten years. But these movements take a long time to build up, and they tend to take a long time even when they head back the other direction. As I said, it took us 18 years to ride out the last bad period. And I hope to hell none of us uh, see another 18 years. But what I do see again is with just a little bit of luck, uh, we are clearly, even I, uh, expect to live long enough now to see full legalization in another state. most of you will with that question, but even a lot of us old timers, I think, are going to make it. Um, what I think we have to be careful about is that we understand the campaign that is winnable right now. It is not technically a pro pot campaign. What the data shows us is, well, first off, uh, the percentage of American adults who smoke marijuana is somewhere between 11 and 13 percent. So what that means is between 89 and 87 percent of the adult population do not smoke. And so if we are going to win this issue, our argument must appeal to a majority of those non-smokers. It is our goal cannot be limited to winning applause at the Seattle Hemp Fest or the Boston Freedom Rally or at a normal conference, as nice as we find them, that is reinforcing. We have to make sure that our arguments appeal to the majority of non-smokers in America. And that is precisely what Colorado has done, it's what Washington has done, and it is why those initiatives enjoy, right now at least, eight, nine, ten point lead among the public. So let's make sure we don't lose sight. I like getting high. I've been smoking now for 47 years. I like to brag that I first smoked marijuana when I was a freshman at Georgetown Law School. I know Georgetown loves me to say that. <laughs> 
But so I'm a stoner, and uh, if I if I could pick what a marijuana law would look like, I would pick the tomato one. You know, don't, don't give me any limits whatsoever. Let me grow as much as I want and share it with friends, and it's none of the state's business. That will never. Yeah. That will never pass in America, folks. That simply isn't going to happen. So what we need to do is to pare down and recognize those parts of that that are achievable. And what is achievable is, is Jimmy Carter famously said in uh, his statement to the Congress in 1976 in a, a line that I uh, actually can take credit because I helped draft it. I had the fortunate time to have a speechwriter ask me to come over and help him draft that statement for the president. And he said uh, a line we had come up with was that uh, the laws against marijuana should never cause more harm than the use of the drug itself. Uh, that's not a pro-pot position, folks. That's a marijuana prohibition is bad statement, is what it is. And that still should be at the center of all of our political arguments. So uh, I don't see any short-term risks. I don't think the parents' movement is going to gain much ground. I think that argument that it sends the wrong message to kids, people have largely gotten over that. I mean, if we dumb down America, to where adults cannot do anything that's inappropriate for children. You can't drive cars, have sex, ride motorcycles, skydive. I mean, what the, who wants to live in a society where all you can do is something appropriate for a 12-year-old? <laughs> so, Pedal to the metal. I think we need to put every resource we can garner to moving this ahead. And if we do, I literally do not see any major pitfalls in the immediate future. We're winning this battle, folks, finally. I was on K Rock the other morning, the biggest rock and roll station in the United States here out of Los Angeles. And so, you know, we did some QA in the morning, and, and that's for me one of the best parts the biofeedback you get from people who are calling in. So in the 1990s, I used to do, you know, hundreds and hundreds of calls a month of people calling up, doesn't it cause males to develop breasts? Doesn't it cause criminality? Don't you go on to use harder drugs? And I find myself always talking about the gateway effect, et cetera, et cetera. Today, very few questions come from any strata of society about those. Most are forward-looking. How much will it be taxed? Will I still be drug tested? Um, uh, can I still be? In, uh, can I? Can I use it in front of my children? Those are the questions I get now in the back and forth. Um, so, Dale, as we are here in pure rapture about marijuana and its legalization. It was made illegal, and it was made illegal first in Massachusetts. So in, in a very encapsulized way, can you help inform everybody here, why did this start? And in your view, why has it lasted 75 years? Well, it isn't 75 years, it's 100 years. That's and that's the important point here. Uh, you know, the common story about marijuana prohibition is it was made federally illegal by the Marijuana Tax Act in 1937, uh, at the instigation of uh, Harry Anslinger, the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, and this Reefer Madness campaign led by the Hearst Press, and its public hysteria over pot smoking Mexicans and Negroes and jazz musicians. But in fact, by that time, marijuana had already been made illegal in most of the states of the United States. And there was, in fact, an earlier cannabis prohibition movement that really got going 100 years ago uh, when the whole drug control uh, movement started in the United States. Over 100 years ago, of course, it used to be that drugs were entirely legal, but things started changing uh, at the turn of the last century. And there were two major developments behind this. One was there was a nationwide prohibition temperance movement that was really focused on alcohol. And there's all sorts of stories at that time, 100 years ago, about the evils of alcohol. And uh, that was uh, you know, a major campaign that led to a constitutional disaster and alcohol prohibition. Along with it, though, a lot of the proponents of this uh, prohibition thought that this should go to all sorts of intoxicants, and that included um, uh, narcotics, uh, opium, morphine, cocaine. Now, cannabis wasn't really part of this con conversation. There was no public concern about cannabis at the time. It was hardly used at the 
time. And what we call marijuana from Mexico really didn't get popularized until the 1920s. Nonetheless, cannabis got swept up in the movement for national narcotics control. Uh, and this was done really at the instigation of another new class that was arising at the time, the class of drug control bureaucrats. 100 years ago was the, initial, was the height of the progressive movement. The progressive movement was dedicated to getting government involved in things uh, for the betterment of our health and welfare, uh, uh, getting away from the unregulated free market and making sure we had clean uh, food and drugs and things like that. And it was, of course, the Pure Food and Drugs Act uh, was first passed about 100 years ago by the progressives. Now, the Pure Food and Drugs Act, which is a fine act, uh, had a labeling provision in it that said, from now on, it didn't restrict the sale of what we call narcotics or intoxicants, but it did say that if you had a product, patent medicine, that had a drug in it, like alcohol, or opium, or cocaine, or cannabis, or chloral hydrate, which was a, I don't hear much about that anymore, that was a big, big scare at that time. But those had to be put on the label. Um, so you had this list of narcotics hanging around. Um, and about the same time, a little after this, you started to see some of the states taking action to limit the sale of these narcotics to prescription only, basically outlawing recreational use, like opium dens and things like that. Uh, and this happened in many states. Massachusetts, in fact, uh, put a law through in 1911, and it required the labeling. It restricted all narc uh, hypnotics, it said, to prescription only. You could no longer buy hypnotics over the counter. But with the hypnotics, well, you know, opium is in there, I think they, including cocaine, though it's not a hypnotic. And, and cannabis indigo was just incidentally thrown in the list. Um, now, this happened too here in California. In fact, uh, we're about to celebrate the centennial of cannabis prohibition here in California. It happened in 1913. And we're going to have a conference about this commemorating it in San Francisco in January 26th and 27th. Everybody's invited to come up to Fort Mason. And we will dis discuss ending the 100-year war against cannabis. But basically, this was instigated by the California State Board of Pharmacy, which was really the agency that launched the first war on drugs uh, in, in pretty much in the nation. It was uh, organized here in California because it specifically there had been a lot of uh, 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 controversy over opium dens. So the Board of Pharmacy got this law passed that restricted opium to prescription only, and then they could go out and bust the dens, and they started uh, 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 the whole routine of the current war on drugs. We had drug raids and informants and all of this sort of thing. Uh, they did that in 1907, and in 1911 to 12, one of the, the head of this, this campaign, a gentleman named Henry J. Finger, uh, on the California Board of Pharmacy, said, you know, maybe we ought to include Indian hemp along with this. Now, he didn't say marijuana because nobody was much concerned about it, nobody had much heard of it. Indian hemp, however, was being used by some East Indian Hindus, actually they were Sikhs, who had recently come in San Francisco, and uh, the Board of Pharmacy uh, noted that, well, they, some of them are using this Indian hemp stuff. Maybe we better just prohibit it so it doesn't spread to the whites. And that's what they did. Uh, there was actually no public demand for this at all. The pharmacists were against the law, but nobody paid attention because nobody was really using it. Uh, now, the idea of the law was explained by Mr. Finger in a letter to the first U.S. drug czar, Hamilton Wright, who served in the State Department and helped engineer the uh, uh, Hague Convention and the uh, 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 Harrison Act, which would in institute narcotics prohibition in the United States. Finger and uh, Wright seriously discussed 
including cannabis in the international treaties and restrictions on drugs that they were instituting for opium and cocaine. And in their correspondence, uh, they say, yeah, you know, sure, this cannabis isn't used much now, but you know, maybe once we clamp down on the opium, fiends will start turning to that. So that's just to include it. Now, it didn't get included in any national legislation, but it did get included in California, and a bunch of other states started joining on in Indiana, Wyoming, it's, it's crazy. None of these places had a marijuana problem. So the idea was, we will pass these laws to prevent the marijuana problem, of course, or the cannabis problem. The irony of it is, all the modern problems of marijuana have occurred in an environment of prohibition that was intended to prevent this in the first place. We, we, we never did have a legal marijuana market here in California. Um, and I think there's an important lesson in this, in who was really responsible for doing this. Was there any public demand for it? No. It was written by drug control bureaucrats, by the state boards of pharmacy. And so have all our other laws. So was the 1937 Marijuana Tax Act. So was the Controlled Substances Act. And it is drug control bureaucrats at the DEA who keep marijuana on Schedule One even today. So I think the lesson here is that the marijuana laws have been a crime creation program for the benefit of the drug, nar uh, the narcocracy, as Dick Coward calls it. And I think if you look at it today, they are in fact the major political obstacle we have to moving the agenda forward in the US. Uh, well, to take 75 years, thank you, Dale, because uh, I think you're right. When it comes to the five pillars of pot prohibition, I certainly included the very first one. The entities that were born of the prohibition, the DEA, ONDCP, NIDA, SAMHSA, and I can name 20 other bureaucracies none of you have ever heard of that suck up billions and billions of our dollars a year to keep this machinery going, even though the public doesn't support it. Um, so thank you, that's very cogent in understanding how we started this process. Um, Dr. Lynn Zimmer, when she was alive, um, and was a wonderful uh, researcher and individual and normal board member. Uh, I visited her apartment one time in New York and she had this amazing uh, full page story about marijuana. And I remember looking at it thinking, wow, it's hysterical. The headline was crazy. It was it's hysterical to read. And I thought, well, surely this has got to be like a 1935, 1937, 1940 publication. And she said, uh, no, look at the uh, publication date and where it was published. It was in 1927, Greenwich Village. Even then, that was the most bohemian place in all of America. And yet, uh, and now that is not in my office. When she passed away, she uh, gave that to me. And so for those who have never come to the normal office, please come and check out in my office that amazing 1927 story um, that predates by 10 years the federal prohibition and the supposed conspiracy that made hemp illegal. Mitch, I know you're an academic um, and you have an activist soul and you're so generous to all of us, but I'm gonna put you on the spot here because we've never talked about this before, but what will it take? I mean, given you had your total druthers and you didn't have to work through the politics of all this, which has made my hair prematurely gray, but is it civil discipline, as Tom has suggested, is it, is it, do we have to get Gandhi in here, which is something I've always advocated here. It's one thing for us to put our money on the table, put our suits on and advocate, but we're not putting our bodies in front of them. We're not making them step over our bodies to go into their workplace or go to their churches or synagogues. Some of us have, and they've won awards here for being so brave, but not in Toto, not us, not us, the little class suit-wearing people. Um, is it mass advertising? If we had $5 million on the table every year with the best, uh, as again, Tom alluded to, messaging, could we message this better? Um, or in some ways, do we keep converting the elites, which I think Ethan has been very successful in his 20 years of trying to get those who are really uh, 
resourceful and have so much sway over society to embrace these reforms. So what would you do, given your druthers? It, it's funny because I, I've, I've fallen into the science of persuasion. It seems as if more and more cannabis-related data may not be what we need. It's pretty obvious when you look at this literature that cannabis is harmless. Now, what do I need to find out? What do I need to investigate? How do I get my friends to vote for these things? Right? How do I get my mother-in-law to vote for this? Right? She's in London, she's got Rick Steves' book. That's my, that's my way to get to it. Right? Each of us has a friend who smokes pot who's not a member of normal. We gotta reach, reach these folks. And the way I've been starting is, uh, 50 million Elvis fans can't be wrong. <laughs> okay. Social proof. Now that we're polling above 50%, I go to people and I say, look, most Americans think a tax and regulated market is better. Why do you think they think that? And then I've got them generating a reason for why prohibition needs to end. And suddenly they're on our way. Hey, I'm sending in my monthly pledge to normal. Give me a dollar and I'll add it. Right? And then suddenly they're an activist too. They take on this identity. And the persuasion literature is on our side with this. It's just each of us has to talk to somebody like Richard Lee's mom in the gym. Each of us has to ask a friend for a dollar. Each of us has to go to the people who we're not out to and God forbid, come out to them. And then we're gonna make it happen because we gotta do it soon. <laughs> well, uh, uh, what, uh, the allusion to tithing, if you will, the idea of, of reaching down and making everybody in the row feel like, I've got to put a little in the game. We fail, I think, as a movement to do that, but we're kind of insular, if you will. Um, and so for myself, as I, at last year's conference, my lecture was, do things beyond marijuana. Have interests beyond marijuana, because we can't get everybody involved in these reforms if we're just sort of monolithic about just being obsessed about him saving the world, or that you know, marijuana is the greatest thing since sliced bread, which it is, but you know. So, um, thank you, Mitch. Uh, in terms of, uh, now, messaging. Um, if, if we as reformers were to have that proverbial $5 million to put out all kinds of ads, uh, what would be, in the three or four areas you would try to touch upon, what would you, Ad advanced reformers should be messaging about. This is going to increase the peace. We have data to suggest that when police officers aren't back down at the precinct fingerprinting somebody for an ounce, they're keeping rapists and murderers off, the, off our streets. And that, I think, is first and foremost the one we can go with. Let's increase the peace by creating this tax and regulated market which is one of the reasons why I've always said the most single important group of the 30 or 40 that are chartered and involved with marijuana law and drug policy reform today, while they might not have the most resources, they have the most sway morally and politically is LEAP, Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. This is a group we all have to none of us can bring to the table, and I think it addresses uh, Mitch's concern about uh, peace and public safety. Um, well, Emily, having heard everybody here talk about like how we got from point A to point B, how is it, do you think, that we can communicate better not only to parents, but to this new generation of children that have so much access to information instantaneously, could literally today, with my iPhone, put in a few keywords and pull down more information than I ever could have gotten in six years of undergraduate studies. <laughs> six, of course. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think that's a really important question. I mean, I was a D.A.R.E. graduate, Stan Tall, all of these other things, like all of these, I mean, I remember watching cartoon all-stars to the rescue, yeah. reading the new Teen Titans comic books. I mean, there's something to be said for coming of age in the early 1990s, isn't there? Um, so there was a massive amount of information that was specifically being targeted to children aged 10 and under, uh, telling them that... Put the microphone Oh yeah, sorry. Um, so there's all this information being targeted specifically to children who are 10 and under, uh, telling them, you know, one toke, Addicted, death, um, 
horrible things will happen to you. Also, responding to the crack cocaine epidemic, which is something um, on a totally different scale. But there is this movement, and there is this initiation, and there is this impetus to start talking to these children about, about this at such an early age. And I feel as though, because so much information is available, and one of the things that the parent movement did turn around, the, you know, the harm reduction argument was kind of taken off of the table. But I think that should be back on there. And one of the things that you do see happening uh, with anti-drug education now, the focus is more on making responsible choices. And I think that's actually important, to be able to teach kids how to make responsible choices, but giving them all of the information, rather than just this totally coded, totally biased stuff. Um, will that happen? I don't know. One of the things I want to talk to, uh, one of the people I want to talk to are my friends who are currently elementary school teachers. Uh, people I went to high school with who had gone into education. And I want to see if DARE is still around. I know it's in a few schools. I mean, it's been overwhelmingly proven to not be effective. Um, <laughs> come on. But, um, <laughs> I died immediately after my first talk. Um, and untrue. Um, but I think it's, it's about offering children. I mean, children aren't dumb. I think that's the other thing. The parent movement really thought that uh, kids were really stupid. And they're not. They're intelligent, they're intelligent, very small human beings. So I think offering them a variety of information um, and then offering them the ability to learn how to make choices for themselves. And that's the platform of MAMA still, Mothers Against Misuse and Abuse. Um, so it's, it's the ability to offer children a wide variety of information, a wide array of it, as opposed to simply giving them one totally pervasive and totally biased perspective. I, um, I, I was asked to speak to one of my nephews. I don't have children, I'm not blessed in that respect, uh, but my brothers and sisters are. And so uh, I said, well, could you talk to one of the kids about, you know what, um, from your perspective, now that we're having to confront it? And I found myself, you know, trying to work through, like, abuse versus abuse. And we get done, and the kid says, have you gone to that recent dab site? Uh, uh, like, you can watch people like dab and like totally lose it. He's <laughs> 14. And so the idea that like we think we know, we can communicate with them, and they're already way out culturally ahead of us. I was, I was shocked. I was kind of scared. <laughs> um, before, we're going to try to do about 10 minutes of Q&A since we've got folks up here, but I want to just wind it down with this one open question that I, I like, kind of like to end these things on looking forward to today. Um, Emily, when marijuana is legal, will it still be fun? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thinking about, uh, I'll put a little more meat on the bone regarding like liabilities and things like that. I mean, uh, in 20 or 30 years, where marijuana may well be a legal tax controlled substance like alcohol, tobacco, pharmaceuticals, potentially, um, will we enjoy it? Dave Lenson, who was a professor of yours at UMass, he has suggested that no, it will no longer be cool, it will no longer be hit, it won't even get you high. <laughs> and this is a pharmacological test that I can't wait to conduct. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a great example of the depth on this panel. Uh, I, I haven't thought about David in years. So, yeah, uh, all the science is in there, there's no doubt about it. Um, but as the clock ticks right now, if we run this out, if passes prologue, we're in the eighth year of a 23-year legal battle. So no matter what happens, they have enough dilatory tactics that they can get us to at least the 23-year mark in this case. Excellent question, Bill. No one? Yes, hi. I'm Dan Levine, uh, Executive Director of Patients for Full Legalization Pact. But my question is a short one. Uh, the federal government, uh, since the Supreme Court ruled genetic uh, organisms could be patented, owns the patent on the uh, antioxidant and neuroprotective properties of cannabis. What do you see that patent, what role do you see it playing into the future and what are they up to? Dale or Mitch? That's good. Well, uh, actually I don't think that that patent is going to have very much effect on anything because I, the government is not about to make use of the patent. Uh, the government's only pot producer is NIDA and NIDA doesn't want to get in the medical market. Uh, and I, I, I really think the whole patent issue is going to be here 
irrelevant to cannabis, the herb. And you're going to see lots of patents about you know things like Sativex and other kinds of extracts and uh, uh, and chemical entities. But I I, I think that that's not going to affect uh, the way cannabis is available. That said, the antioxidant properties are now well established, and I think uh, that what gives me so much hope about all of us being around for so long. <laughs> Another question? Hi, I'm Jesse Silverman from New York City, and uh, I remember when Marty Frank told us, told us all in Washington, D.C., dude, you guys are too obsessed with history. People don't care about that. They don't want to hear about history, and they want to know now, should, should marijuana be legal or not, and stop boring people. That said, uh, you know, I remember Dr. John Morgan, and we have friends right now who are, are medical doctors and members of normal that are still saying, at least in New York City, there definitely was a recreational hashish, hashish and marijuana market at the turn of the century. And just from some of the history that we went into today, uh, should New York be an exception there? Were there many people who were commercially uh, sharing cannabis for the same reasons uh, people like it now? Because there's people who are still saying that. Isn't that true? Uh, actually, uh, there wasn't much of a commercial market as an intoxicant. Uh, there was briefly in the 1850s and 1860s, uh, when cannabis was sort of popularized in the United States and introduced in the famous uh, book by Fitzhugh Ludlow, uh, was, was published, popularized cannabis. Uh, there was a brief state of hashish products that got marketed commercially. There was a reaction against them from medical societies uh, saying, hey, you shouldn't be advertising hashish candy. That's inappropriate. This is a medicine. And those, that, that, those advertisements disappear. By the 1890s, 1900, you had basically a pharmaceutical market. You went into the pharmacy and you could buy these things, but they were never promoted as an intoxicant uh, at that time, at that late, uh, at that day. So there was the, the, in, you know, 100 years ago, people had second thoughts about any use of intoxicants whatsoever. Uh, and, you know, that has sort of stayed with us ever since, to tell you the truth. Uh, we'll take one more question. Um, and before we take the question, uh, I'd like to, in advance, thank the panel for coming to California, investing so much time and energy to be here, and to share your expertise, which you know ranged across, and I'm sure they'll be willing uh, if they're here afterwards to talk. Um, so let's have the last question for this panel. Hi, um, I'm Loretta Turner, I'm a founding member of the Rampo College chapter. I work with a lot of children, um, particularly my younger brother is 13, a lot of nieces and nephews, I babysit a lot. They've all asked me questions about marijuana, and I'm very much stumped as to what to tell them, how to move forward. And as an activist, I don't really want to tell my brother that I smoke a lot of pot. At the same time, I have to, to be honest. So, how do I work with children? How do I tell them? Oh, well, um, I would certainly defer to three parents on here about how they did it. Um, but I will suggest that whenever I take this question a ton, as you can imagine, um, I refer them to one book. Um, it's not perfect but it's now 25 to 27 years old, and I still think it holds water. That's Dr. Andy Wiles and Winifred Rosen's From Chocolate to Morphine, which basically makes the argument to the child, in your lifetime, from literally from chocolate all the way to something as dangerous and addictive as morphine, you will interact with in your life. And to a point I raised, with Emily regarding, isn't it really about use versus abuse? That's the paradigm we have for alcohol. If you use alcohol responsibly, then it's really no concern of the government. But if you misuse it or abuse it, clearly, obviously, self-evidently, there are rules and regulations around it. So um, that's my suggestion, that one single book really helps put the onus on the child and the parent to understand you're never going to live a drug, there's never been a drug-free atoll, mountaintop, Desert place, never was, probably never will be, probably never should be. So, uh, but I would defer to the parents uh, about how did they talk about it. Uh, Gail, or, or Emily, about children? I would like to mention Mitch's book. Yes. <laughs> so he 
doesn't have to <laughs> mention himself. I just picked it up. It's a parent's guide to uh, yeah. talking about marijuana with your child. I'll let the author continue to. Yeah. <laughs> so the key is it's just part of, of the big relationship. What do, you, what do you say to your children about marijuana is the same thing you say to your children about other decisions about their health. We have data to suggest that cannabis is really not for kids. I love you guys. I love cannabis. I look forward to the time when your brain is developed, when you've got so much uh, physical development, mental development, emotional development, that we get the chance to share it. Keith, what about raising children? Well, um, my daughter, who's now 43 and lives uh, just a few miles from here, and I have two lovely grandsons, uh, she grew up at my feet at all of the early normal meetings, sometimes Ramsey Clark and Hunter Thompson, and then there'd be my little daughter, Lindsay. And there were a lot of people, I'm sure, that felt that was inappropriate, that, my God, what damage have I done to that young woman? Well, like most generational changes, uh, my daughter has no interest in smoking marijuana. And in fact, uh, when I go visit her, uh, I smoke with my son-in-law, her husband, and she laughs that uh, it's only when her father comes to visit there's ever any marijuana in the house. So, so I, I think largely, now again, I didn't, obviously I didn't turn my daughter on, but she was around it, and it was no big deal. So uh, I, I think Mitch's approach is right. Uh, let's just be honest about it, and there's nothing wrong with telling a child that they will be allowed to do a lot of things once they're a little more mature, but it's simply too early. They may not like it, but that is part of being a parent. And as I say, uh, didn't seem to do any damage to my daughter whatsoever, the fact that she was at an awful lot of normal meetings with a lot of marijuana smoke in the air. Yeah, Dale, you sent your you sent daughter off to college. Yeah, well, yeah, let me say I had the same experience as Keith did in this. Uh, I brought my daughter around, she was around marijuana from infancy in one way or another. She was in marijuana gardens, but she always, uh, if she, when she saw it used, it was being used by adults like alcohol. And, you know, we just brought her up with the understanding that this is one of the things that grown-ups do. And uh, we never had any problem with it until the one, the one difficulty I can think of was when she first entered kindergarten, and I had to explain to her that there was this society uh, had a different attitude toward marijuana and it was illegal and so you had to have the had to be a little discreet about discussing it and it was very hard for me to even explain to her why that would be the case because she just sort of took it naturally. Uh, I will say she graduated from high school. Uh, she uh, got, uh, she was one of, the, one of her class to have the drug free award for not using any alcohol or drugs the whole time she was in high school. God bless her heart. Uh, she's, she's uh, I, I think, become more of an adult in, in more recently. But uh, I, I, I think that the, uh, the fee, I think there's an awful lot of backlash against tipping parents, though. <laughs> in some ways, we could turn to our friends in the anti-drug world and say, if you want kids not to use marijuana, <laughs> Again, thank you very much for this panel. Uh, we're going to wait for 15 minutes to come back and have a forward look and a frank discussion about legalization and taxation. Thank you. We'll be back in about 12.30.